now be recorded. Okay, folks, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the uh, March meeting of the Harwich Golf Committee, uh, March 16th, uh, 4 o'clock, and it's uh, <clears throat> in a virtual format as prescribed by the uh, governor and according to those mandates uh, that are set forth uh, uh, in the agenda. Uh, as far as uh, the order of business is concerned, uh, we'll, we'll start with... Uh, the consent agenda, uh, which seeks the approval of the uh, minutes uh, as they've been submitted by Mike Sergeant, our secretary. So motion to approve. Second. So moved. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous, thank you. Uh, and now we'll move to the uh, director's report. Roman? Okay, let me get my screen share going. All right, how are we doing? Can everybody see them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay, so I had very little information that I, I uh, prepared for today. Um, as I mentioned to you in a, in a um, email earlier in the day, it has been crazy at the golf course with early spring weather and tremendous returns on our um, early uh, annual pass drive. So um, things are really cooking at the golf course. We opened the greens for the season on uh, last Friday, which was March 12th, I believe. Hey, Clem, uh, before I go on, can we ask everybody to mute their mics? Cause I'm getting a lot of feedback. Okay. Uh could you do that, folks, please? Clem, just before, I just got an email. Paul White said he got a, I mean, he couldn't connect in, so he might have the old. Um... Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll text him. I emailed him, I emailed him to look for the, for the new email you just sent out a few minutes ago, Clem, that has the right one. Okay, thanks. How's that better, Roman? Okay, sounds better. So sorry about that. I don't know if everybody else was hey, hearing the guys. feedback, but it was a little distracting. I made it. Okay, wonderful. So I'll, I'll keep on going. So, um, I'm, so I mean, I'm really. Um, you can't. Hi, Paul. Uh, sorry, there was a there was a problem with the damn. Uh, uh, Thank you. you know, sorry protocol. about that. What's your what What's your email? Okay, I'm going to mail you the uh, agenda with the uh, correct number on it. I do not know, you know, precisely what happened here, but let me just repeat that it's K E N N Y R O W D. Okay, uh, if yeah, I'll check my email and I'll I'll when Paul is in, right around to you. All right, keep going, Roman. Okay, are we all ready? Yeah. Okay, real fast. So um, with, the, with the spring weather early in March, we rushed to, to open the greens because the, the weather conditions allowed it. So last Friday, we opened the greens for the season. Uh, we had tremendous feedback from our annual pass holders. We, we had a few days uh, at the end of last week and into the weekend where we had 80 to 100 golfers on the golf course, which is really unheard of for us at this time of year. Uh, the, as I'll go into the numbers shortly, the returns on our annual pass uh, contest have been historic. Uh, we, we've got great response to our annual pass sales. Uh, so that's been uh, really strong. I'll, I'll share those numbers shortly. Um, according to the agenda, Clem, you wanted me to go over the finance committee meeting. I shared yeah. with everybody the document that I sent to the finance committee as a backup document to our discussion on uh, this past Saturday. But that's an annual meeting where we present our budget for FY22. And uh, it's a joint meeting between the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee. 
uh, we had a discussion for about a half an hour. I was joined by Clem and Sean Fernandez. And I, th I thought we got great feedback. I'll let Clem uh, comment on that as well, but I thought we got great feedback on our uh, revenue projections, on our uh, outlook going forward in FY22. And, and as you'll see in the document, we, we followed the directions of the town administrator and the board of selectmen by returning a balanced budget, a level funded budget. So uh, as I told them in the document, I, I presented it, it's a very lean budget and uh, we're dealing with a very lean budget right now which is the reason that even if it was 80 degrees today and nice and dry, we would not be able to put golf carts on the golf course uh, because we just don't budget the staff for it at this time of year. So uh, we're, we're, we're um, budgeting our staff hours very carefully going into this season, uh, uh, working with uh, very tight budgets. But um, the outlook's very good based on our early membership sales and our early uh, tea time bookings. So let me go on to some numbers here. So I provided everybody with this financial spreadsheet you're getting used to seeing. Uh, these numbers are through January of 21. Um, so the, the annual past sales that, that have been so strong are not necessarily represented on this. They'll be represented on the upcoming month's spreadsheets. But you'll see that uh, our, our revenue projections currently, as of January, before the surge in annual past sales, uh, has us outperforming FY19, which was our all-time high in uh, revenue, so uh, you know, I, th I think I think we're going to be approaching the two million mark for the first time ever. Uh, we've never cracked 1.9 million, so you know, I think in upcoming budgets, if we hit two million dollars in revenue th for this fiscal year, that that'll open the door for an expansion in our in our uh, annual budget in, as, as far as expenses and uh, salaries and wages. Um, does anybody have any questions on the financial spreadsheet? Okay, I'll, I'll keep moving on. We can always go back. So here's some uh, annual pass sales numbers. Uh, the, at the top of the screen, you'll see where it says MEM 500. So that's the number of annual pass sales we've sold so far this uh, for, for this fiscal year. Uh, that's because yesterday the contest for early registration closed. Normally we see that number between about 300 and 330. Uh, for the close of that contest, so we are well ahead of uh, schedule. Uh, you know, I, th I think you can make out the categories, but you've got Harwich Renewal, New Harwich, Chatham Renewal, New Chatham, East Ham Orleans Renewal, or New East Ham Orleans. So we're looking at 70-something new uh, annual pass sales and a lot of renewals. It looks like we're probably going to have more annual pass holders this year than in the past, but then again, Maybe not. As I mentioned at the last golf committee meeting, we're using a new email administrator. So we're reaching a lot more people than we did in the past. When I sent out information regarding this contest, I sent it out to all former annual pass holders in our database. And, and I know directly from speaking to a few people that uh, they had, had their annual pass had lapsed for a few years. They received that email and decided to rejoin. So it could be that we're seeing a surge in people signing up for the contest that maybe you hadn't previously known about it. But I did take part in a uh, study that's being done by the National Golf Foundation. Um, at the, they're, they're being paid by Brewster to do a, um, uh, a, a look at their operation. And they, the gentleman that I spoke with said, uh, he's hearing from every other director of golf on the Cape that their, their annual pass sales are exceeding what they have been in the past. So the surge in golf continues. Any questions on this spreadsheet here? Yeah, Roman. Um, any sense for how we're doing with the Chatham renewals in comparative terms to other years since we started year one of that three-year phased price increase for them? You know, I, I don't have that data for, for this date snapshot, but if you'll remember, we were at about 220 Chatham uh, resident annual passes last year we're at about we're over 100 right now so uh you know we, we've got about half what we had last year at this point so no i, I don't really have that snapshot at, at this point in time but um I, I would say we're strong across the board okay thanks you're welcome roman does a lot of it come in closer to the deadline you know do a lot of people wait until uh march or april 
So, you know, the, the deadline for our contest was, was uh, yesterday. We do a tremendous amount before that. So the past week or so has been tremendous. And, you know, that takes a lot of phone calls, a lot of tech res response from our, our, our staff. So, you know, I got to give kudos to Mike Surgeon and Dick Fagan. Uh, we've been running a very busy golf course and running a phone that, that's, you know, th these sales don't happen on their own. They happen by holding people's hands and answering a lot of questions. So it's been very busy doing these. The people that choose not to take part in the contest normally don't renew until they're they're back on the Cape for the summer or until they play their first round of the year. So the, the contest is really designed to operationally get some money in the bank and to um, get, get the uh, administrative side of, of renewals and purchases out of the way in the off season. So we don't have to do it with, you know, uh, on a Saturday of mother's day weekend, when we're really busy and have people coming up to the, uh, uh, counter um, when we're, you know, and say they're on the first tee in 10 minutes and we have to go through all the paperwork. Any other questions? Okay. Can I just so, send that to you? So I'll move on. So that being said, we were going to announce our winners and, and actually um, generate our winners right here at the meeting. If you'll bear with me, I, I climb as a spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a random number generator and we will actually, instead of pulling the names out of a hat, we'll actually generate the winners right here. I was hoping I would get a chance to test this out before the meeting, but um, bear with me as, I, as uh, we may not have that opportunity. Have you got the number, uh, Roman? I'm going to try to share it on the screen. Are you still seeing my my uh, PowerPoint presentation on the screen? Uh, no. Okay, good. Okay, here we go. So, Clem, do you have the uh, uh, spreadsheet available? I have the spreadsheet available. All right. And here we go. So I'll plug in the parameters into the random number generator. I'm going to do numbers two through 80 to 485. You'll notice the number is not 500. That's because according to the town administrator, in order to uh, comply with ethics and avoid any conflict of interest, all staff members of Cranberry Valley have been taken out of the, the running, as well as staff members of the town of Harwich, as well as members of the golf committee. So. Uh, we will not have any winners on this phone call here. Uh, okay, so for the for the winner of the annual pass, the number is three fifty four clown. Three fifty four. And the winner is uh, because you have a preface, you've got a, actually a one. It's it's one three five four correct Roman. Uh, no, the, just look at the the side all the way on the left, Clem, for number three hundred and fifty four. Not not the one that begins with it, not the number in the thousands, but the column on the left. Roman, I don't. Uh, Clem, I think he means the low number of the spreadsheet. What's that? The low number of the spreadsheet. The number, the number on the left side of the screen on the spreadsheet. So I'll scroll down to it. I think everybody can see my screen here. I was trying to protect everybody's identity, but let's go ahead and award a winner. Winner of the annual pass is James Duncan. Okay. God. 
Will you return? Sorry. Okay, so we'll give away a, um, a uh, range pass next. And the winner on that is going to be number 400. Which is Jimmy Barr. Okay. Congratulations to the winners. Congratulations. And thank you to everybody for participating. And that's all. If unless anybody has questions, Clem, that's all I have for you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Roman. Uh, just a footnote to uh, what Roman uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, the finance committee meeting on Saturday was uh, uh, very well received, as, as Roman said. And uh, actually, there were only a couple of uh, questions from uh, members of the finance committee. And basically, it uh, uh, they were inquiring as to how we had addressed uh, you know, adjusting key time allocation, uh, you know, for the annual pass holders. And uh, other than that, it, the remarks were very positive, especially about the finances. So if, if that gives you a little further insight, uh, uh, that's what I have to share. Um, as far as the agenda is concerned, um, I'm just going to bring that up. I think, uh, you know, because we've, we've gone to this trouble, uh, I, I'd like to engage uh, John Crook uh, to uh, uh, kick off our discussion of the uh, strategic plan. Uh, this, of course, is being updated uh, this year because it fits in with the fact that we're trying to, uh, under the auspices of uh, John Wheeler's work, uh, create a vision statement uh, to, to kind of give us a snapshot of what the Cranberry Valley operation is going to look like, uh, you know, five years down the road, which would be our goal. So, uh, uh, John, if you would, uh, the floor is yours. You're muted, John. Okay, good. I think in your, I think in your meeting materials, we sent out the uh, rough draft that I came up with for the uh, strategic plan. Is, did everybody get that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, I was gonna use that rough draft strictly as a straw man to get the ball rolling and to get feedback from the group in terms of uh, you know how we should move forward. Uh, I think the important thing in the strategic plan is number one, identifying the topics that we want to make sure that are included in the uh, strategic plan. And that would include the mission statement, the vision statement. I also included the guiding principles that we use as a golf committee here at Cranberry Valley, uh, who our competition is, and then taking a look at what our long-term goals are as well as our short-term goals. I think uh, we've had a lot of discussion so far in terms of mission statement and vision statement. Jack Conley, I know, just sent out this morning a, uh, a descriptive piece on what is a mission statement and what is a vision statement. And to put it succinctly, a mission statement is what we are today, what Cranberry Valley is today. And a vision statement is a look to the future, what we want to be or what we want to be working on in the next five years uh, to supplement that mission statement. So, you know, we've had the mission statement now, I'd say for at least the first time we took a crack at this was at least five or six years ago. I, I could be off on the timing on that, but the mission statement to provide an enjoyable golfing experience for Howard's residents and non-resident guests. That includes a well-conditioned championship golf course with appropriate amenities at a fair, reasonable price that makes Cranberry Valley an attractive destination, an asset to the town of Howard in the local economy as one of the premier most municipal golf courses on Cape Cod and Southeast Mass. So I think we've always been comfortable with what 
River Valley is, and I think that kind of describes what we are. Uh, in terms of the, anybody, any, anybody have any doubts about what our current mission statement is, or should we be making changes to the mission statement? John, if I might, uh, I, I really think it encompasses, uh, you know, everything that we had, uh, you know, aspired to, uh, I don't see anything significantly, uh, uh, that might be changed there. I, I'd entertain other comments if you will. Uh, anybody else? Okay, go ahead, John. Okay, uh, going to the vision statement, I know, uh, John and Clem had sent out some of the uh, drafts that we had so far in terms of a vision statement. And I guess, uh, I just put in there, and this is strictly, this has not been approved by any means, but uh, getting back to what Jack had uh, presented before, a vision statement is really what we want to be in the future. And I think when the when you look at the future of what Cranberry Valley is, we should be identifying probably the next five years. And uh, I think it's important here to have facts of where we want to be rather than another statement, which kind of is uh, more prose than facts, if you know what I mean. So I just put down, I put down my vision, but I mean, this is uh, gonna be up to John and John's gonna take a, another crack at this, but you know, when you take a look at where we wanna be the next five years, I think we wanna to continue to invest in the golf course itself. And we wanna have superior golf conditions and i think that's all the result of what we've been doing in terms of our incremental funding whether that be the golf improvement budget the capital plan the infrastructure fund everything is designed to make the cranberry operation a much more superior golf course we also want to invest in the cranberry valley infrastructure so that would include the clubhouse the maintenance bond the cot bond the restaurant i mean things that we want to continually improve in the next five years. And that's really funded by the capital plan as well as the pro shop revolving fund. I think another important aspect of where we want to be is financial stability. As Roman pointed before, we always want to match. We want to increase our revenues obviously every year. We want to continue to increase our budget to accomplish a lot of these objectives, but, uh, I think a lot of that we do through rates and fees, we do through the fund development, and we've even initiated cost saving projects, which will include now the solar initiative that we have, which will bring back money to the town, which is another way of bringing back more financial stability to the Prairie Valley operation. I think another thing that we've done a great job in so far, but I think in the next five years, we can even take it to greater heights would be the development of junior golf because really I think this is very important for us because when you move forward, I mean, these are gonna be the future, hopefully potential members that we have at Cranberry Valley. So when you take a look at the first tee initiative, the youth on golf program, the PGA junior program that Roman has get involved in, in the high school programs that we have right now, these are very important to our future in identifying Cranberry Valley members of in the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years, whenever they become of age. Uh, and then the other thing I think that would be a, an important vision is superior customer service in all facets of the Cranberry Valley operation. So those were just some of the vision statements that I, I saw uh, to put down, but I think, you know, we'll have probably further discussion as we move forward with John Wheeler's recap of what the vision statement should be. Any comments on that, or is, are there any things that we can put in that list of what we want to be in the next five years? Well, uh, John, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Steve. Yeah, I mean, one thing, one thing, and, and, and Roman and I have talked about this in the past. I've talked about this at the meetings in the past. One thing that I would really like to see us do over the next five years is to get to some sense of normalcy, I'll call it, 
on the on the um, budgeting process versus and the and the expense versus versus um, revenue process, i.e., if we are at let's assume, let's for grins and giggles say that we hit break even this year, or or we hit break even last year, I really would like to have a statement that says if we generate more revenue then we're forecasted to generate expenses that we get to reinvest the vast majority of that incremental revenue over expenses back into the golf course in in and in back into the things that are in the vision statement the things that are in the strategic plan that we've prioritized so we can we can do more of them quicker I think that should be a reasonable goal for us to get to is is rather than just, you know, sort of this nebulous, well, you know, we, we really didn't look at the revenue forecast or the revenue generation in this past year, but, oh, you know, Roman, you got to figure out how to do it all with a flat budget, <laughs> even though. I think, I, think, uh, I think Steve brings up a very good point. I don't know if it's a vision statement, though. I think it's, uh, we've been talking about that a lot of, along the way i think a lot of that would be a short-term goal in terms of understanding the finances and coming up with a recommendation to the finance director if that's the direction that we feel that we should move in so i don't maybe, know if that's i don't think i don't necessarily know if that meets the definition of a vision but i think it definitely meets the uh expectation of a of a goal that we should we want to accomplish as a golf committee that's my personal viewpoint yeah. Or maybe John, maybe John, the vision is that we just consistently, um, continuously reinvest into, uh, the betterment of the golf course and in alignment with our strategic plan. Well said, uh, Martha, please. Um, oh, I, I, I don't want to be out of place here, but I thought that we were going to discuss the vision statement in April. And yes. I feel uncomfortable discussing this without John being present. Martha, that's a good point. Uh, I was going to clarify for everyone if it was not clear. Uh, John was very specific since he wasn't able to attend uh, that we would, you know, engage in, uh, you know, a general discussion within the committee of, of the vision statement. Uh, that's why he sent all those draft materials for the sake of conversation regarding the strategic plan. Uh, that's why I put in red, uh, after vision statement sample to be used, you know, just as a, a worksheet, uh, because the strategic plan is predicated on including a vision statement. This is just a model. Uh, so there's nothing written in stone here, uh, and I'm glad you brought that point up. Uh, Steve, I think that's what you just said is consistent with, uh, you know, one of the points that John made. Uh, is there anybody else? Okay, John, go ahead. Uh, just to, uh, that's why I uh, predicated this conversation or this discussion on the vision statement that it was John Wheeler's Billy with, and uh, these are just uh, ideas or a straw man to discuss and get going, but we're going to make the final decision on this come April. Uh, sure. The next area is uh, the guiding principles, and I guess what I mean here by guiding principles is what drives how we operate as a golf committee, and I would think number one would be rates and fees, and our object, uh, uh, recommendation there is to go to the board of selectmen with our rates and fees for the upcoming year i think we also want to take a look at the funds that we have available that we have control over and that would be the golf improvement fund the infrastructure fund the pro shop revolving fund and under each one of those funds i think we need a descriptive of what each fund is for and what the objective is of each one of the funds the other area guiding principle would be policy development at Kerberry Valley with the collaboration of the golf director. I think that's another important responsibility that we have. The other one would be the development of the capital plan. 
and then goal setting both short and long term. Uh, the competition, I guess the competition for us would be very easy. We wanted to, to define that. It would be all public and municipal golf courses on Cape Cod, Southeast of Mass. And then the long-term goals, and I've just put these ideas down. I mean, these are things that we've talked about for a long time, but once again, we can get into more, you know, the weeds a little bit more on this, but, you know, long-term, obviously, the number one priority is the replacement of the sprinkler heads with wireless heads and technology. The other one long-term would be the development of the three hole short game course and punting green complex, which kind of fits in with that, what our junior goal vision is. And the other one would be the restaurant, the operation, the lease, how we move forward in this area. Uh, the annual goals, I don't think really changed that much, but I mean, these are things that we've been working on in the past. We've seen great improvements in the golf, golf course with a lot of these short-term goals and tree removal and stump removal are still an important part of our process of moving forward. We, we've done a lot of that through the golf improvement budget and the regular budget that we have. Bunker restoration is always going to be an important priority on a short-term basis. And I think the uh, methodology that we've used so far is to really attack bunkers on a sporadic basis by, you know, uh, zeroing in on holes, not, let's say number one through three, and then we go from four through six. But I mean, I think bunker restoration is very important when you want to have a one of the finest municipal golf courses around. Uh, the other short-term goal that we have right now, which we'll probably talk about in a few minutes, would be the completion of the Cotborn hot bond project hard to believe this is probably a four or five year project right now that's nearing its completion but thank god it's within a year of completion and it'll be well worth the effort the other thing that we've talked about is tea restoration and i think uh we've done that piecemeal and that's probably the way best way to do it with the limited funds that we have and the other thing that we've uh started working on right now is the solder shack renovation and this has been basically funded by the pro shop revolving fund so i as i said before this strategic plan is really just a straw man for further discussion and i'm open to any suggestions on how we move forward or if we're looking for any other topics that we should include in the strategic plan got jack Conlon. Yeah, uh, John, I, I would include uh, cod path expansion or extension. I don't know how you want to characterize that. And increasing the number of holes that have cod paths on them. Good point. Good point. We are, uh, John, one thing you could um, maybe specifically cite as far as car paths go is following the Mark Mundrum master plan, car path plan. Uh, we do have that plan and I, I can reshare it with the committee. Um, when we when we put together our priorities and, and our um, and our budgeting, um, we in the past had each year what we were gonna do out of that uh, master plan and the, do the COVID crisis and the, and the um, limits on our spending some of those have been pushed back but i, I think I, I i would definitely appreciate the, the committee uh taking on the discussion of um recommending which which of those car paths we should we should do in, in which order i think the, the next ones we we're going to do are holes number one and ten but based on the linear feed of, of the car path that we're talking about it really uh um needs to fit into the annual budget so i i would definitely uh I'll share with the committee once again Mark Mungum's master plan, and I, I think that when we talk about our uh, capital plan, let's let's have a discussion about priorities of that Mark Mungum master plan. I think, yeah, uh, Roman, thank, you, thank you, Jack, and thank you, Roman, because uh, that really was on my list, which I forgot to put in there because I know we've had a lot of discussion, particularly on ten, where we want to reroute the cot path and so forth. So uh, that's a good point. Thank you. That was scheduled for this year and was pushed off based on the spending um, um, hope freeze. So, so that is that is, I believe, our next priority. But based on the linear square feet, uh, linear feet of car path involved in that one, that's I think about a forty to forty-five thousand dollar job 
was our estimate. But but again, I I think as part of the strategic plan, we should prioritize those. Uh, Roman, I think uh, I, you know, and I might be corrected, but I believe on our uh, committee website, town website, uh, that's one of the documents that we have available for review. And uh, John, I would also suggest that uh, you know our forward T program is is one that uh, can use some tweaking as well. And you know we've we've got plans for that, don't we, Roman? I, I would say the exact same thing I just said about the car path plan. We've had, we've had Mark Mungin once again do a master T plan for the golf course that I think, you know, as, as John, as you mentioned, our, our funding is going to be fairly limited uh, annually. But uh, I think if, if we put annual goals for a car path or two and a T or two, I think that's doable going forward. So I, I think that when we come into prioritizing, uh, each annual budget, uh, we, we, we include a car path uh, specifically and a T area specifically. Uh, Jack Conley. Yeah, uh, I agree with Steve about the uh, being able to reinvest the money um, if there's an excess or a revenue is in excess of uh, expenses, but doesn't that start pushing us down the path of an enterprise fund? Yep, but it doesn't mean you have to formally do an enterprise fund. You can certainly reach agreement with the finance committee that says at the end of the year, we take a look at all the golf expenses. We take a look at all the revenue. If there's an excess in revenue over golf expenses, we agree that the following year's budget gets increased for the, go by, uh, for the golf course by 80% of that overage. Done. 20% goes to the town. We get the other 80%. Put it in writing, done. And every year we do the same thing. Okay. I wish, just having gone through some of these discussions, Steve, I wish it was that easy. It seems like anytime you're dealing with money in the town, it becomes a... It's, I think uh, that there, there is a, a method. I think we already have the, the method in place where we could we could do something like Steve's mentioning. You know, I, I when I'm projecting our revenues for the next few years, I think by since we have some a major debt coming off the books this fiscal year and going forward, where that's really going to lessen our our, our um, fully allocated costs. I think by FY24 is what I'm thinking. We're going to be completely. Uh, a negative, or uh, I'm sorry, a neutral revenue generator where we've actually closed the gap between our revenue and our costs. In that year, I think the mechanisms are already in place that when we choose to uh, discuss rates and fees, if we are covering our full costs, we recommend increases to rates and fees to direct them back into our into our dedicated funds. And there, there we have control to do the projects we need to do uh, without engaging uh, in, in greater conversations with, with, with the town or with the finance committee. I think that once we close that gap and, and we're actually, you know, covering our full costs, we just dedicate uh, or, or direct revenues that, that we want to generate from our rates and fees into, you know, back into our uh, dedicated funds and remain um, neutral as far as revenue generation. Obviously, this uh, will need further discussion, but uh, I'm remiss and I apologize, Paul. I did not recognize you. I know you had your hand up, Paul White. No problem. I, there were two quick things because you know, this is an important discussion everyone's having. But two things uh, I really like, John, when you included, uh, you know, in, as part of the discussion of the vision statement, the superior customer service in all facets of Cranberry Valley. Um, I also think that ought to be part of the guiding principles in a sense in, to this extent. Make it user friendly for our customers, but also make the environment respectful and and thoughtful for our staff as well um and, and you know that might include you know have, having to be very obvious about you know a, a, a set of expectations for everyone's behavior um because it can there's an awful lot of pressure put on our employees sometimes um by, by our members and our guests sometimes who are looking for something and i think that ought to be part of our guiding principle as we look at all this yeah good point that's a good 
Point well taken, Paul. Uh, anybody else on the committee? Yeah, I, I don't want to be a dead horse, but I mean, to me, what's frustrating, Roman, is the fact that we lost $100,000 out of the infrastructure fund this year to cover town debts. I think that'll happen in the future, depending on the, um, you know, the, the nature of the finances within the town. I, th I think that was a one-time situation, and, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, uh, officially that was we we contributed to our old debt. I mean, we we, we paid our off uh, you know, the note of our old debt, which we don't normally. So that's officially what that was dedicated to. It didn't just go you know, into the general coffers. Uh, but I think I believe that was a one-time deal, just because of the specific financial crisis that that um, the town faced in that fiscal year. I, I I think with confidence we can go ahead and feed those funds and expect them to generate money for our golf course projects. Okay, uh, I think I Martha, I apologize. Yeah, for the, well. Martha, did you have another comment? Yeah. You're okay? Uh, John? Yep. Uh, I think uh, Steve brought up a good point earlier where we have to really understand the uh, the revenue cost implications of uh, Kerberry Valley operation, especially if we're going to go into that revenue uh, over it. If we overachieve our revenue, how much can we reinvest? But I think to get there, I think we have to do a real good analysis of uh, the budget in the revenue because we've talked about that a long time. What makes up all the costs that we're dealing with? And I think what we have to do is identify the questions that we as a committee want to feel comfortable with. And we've talked about this for the last year, but now that things are getting back to normal a little bit, maybe it's a good opportunity for us in the coming months to get the director of finance to visit us at one of our meetings where she can answer some of the questions that we have and how we move forward and maybe what some of our recommendations are as steve Munch mentioned in terms of reinvestment and uh just get the town's viewpoint on some of these ideas before we start pushing the ball too far down the road okay good enough uh Folks, if, if we can move on, uh, John? Steve, are you okay with that? Oh, absolutely. I just want to understand, you know, what we really spend and how much we really take in and what the difference is. And if there's money left over and the town needs it, okay, we can figure that out, but it all should be transparent. And we shouldn't be held to a flat budget because the town's got other situations. If we generated more revenue than, than we've ever had, uh, they need to, the budget should be driven against the revenue that we're, we're generating, not what the other finances in the town are. That's my opinion. Okay. All right, folks, uh, uh, moving on to uh, old business, uh, if we can. Uh, Roman, I'm going to kick this uh, uh, back to you. Uh, we're going to include folks a, uh, an overview of uh, progress on the restaurant contract, uh, our capital project uh, uh, as updated, and uh, the charger grid uh, progress, our cart lease progress as well, and uh, uh, the Miller Golf uh, uh, contract. So Roman, thank you. Clem, can I go through those all together, or are those individual agenda items? No, sure. Go. You can take them on all together. Okay, great. And then, uh, you know, Clem, you've been in part of these discussions, so feel free to jump in and give your feedback. Uh, there's right. some of the, a few of these items I've discussed with members of the committee, and, and Clem's been involved. Where we currently stand with the restaurant situation, there's not a lot to tell, other than um, we've we've gotten a bid from the hot stove. Uh, we had we had to stop the evaluation of it because the submission was incomplete to a degree, and we were we were risking uh, having to, to uh, have a negative determination on their submission uh, without seeking out addendums from them. Uh, they were they did comply and and uh, fulfill the addendum request we asked for. We had, we did a, a evaluation of that yesterday. Myself, Clem, the town administrator, and the chief procurement officer. And we determined that, that they met the minimums uh, requirements of the bid submission. 
Um, we're now in a stage where the town administrator is going to negotiate with the hot stove directly on, on a price um, for, for the annual rent. Um, so so I, I really don't want to go into the specifics. I don't think it's appropriate, Clem, to go into the specifics of where that stands, you know, other than it's, it's in the town administrator's hands to negotiate directly with Ron Leiter of the hot stove on overpriced. Exactly. Yes, uh, John Crook. Uh, Roman, were there any other bids on the restaurant? No, there was only one, John. So we've got it. Our hands are kind of tied, really. Well, I mean, we, uh, to a degree, uh, but but the town administrator was very clear that, that he does not view that as the situation. Uh, he he's looking to get fair value. On, on this lease, and if not, he, he's quite confident that we could see, uh, seek other alternatives if needed. So uh, he's going into the, the um, negotiation and not feeling we're cornered, but, but feeling uh, he wants to get fair market value for, for what the lease, uh, for what the restaurant represents for the town. I think it's all going to work out fine. I, in, in my view, I don't think it's you know saying anything that people don't know. I think Ron Leiter and the hot stove is the vendor we want to work with. They've done a great job over the past five years. It's just a matter of negotiating the right price. Okay. Okay, Ron. Okay. I'll move on. So the capital project update. Uh, where that currently stands is uh, we're in the final stages with Green Skies uh, getting the um, certificate to operate from Eversource. Well, the current stage of they're, they're in where they're doing a punch list just to complete their project before they get that final, well, before they apply for the permission to operate. So that's where that stands. Uh, we had a brief negotiation with their vendor Kobo over uh, damage to our car barn door where the door was not rocked off its hinges on one of these windy days uh, due to their negligence. And I'll give Kobo all the credit in the world. They took responsibility and uh, repaired our, our, our car barn door for us, which um, was damaged. So uh, I appreciate uh, them for that, take it, taking that responsibility. Um, but uh, that's where that stands currently is we're awaiting the application from Great Green Skies to ever source for a permission to operate. And that's coming shortly. Jack, yes, Jack. I didn't really hear you, Jack. Is that a date for the complete uh, permission to operate? Is that what you said? Yeah, is there a date for the completion of the getting the certificate to operate? Is there a target date? And not at this point. I I, I, got, I spoke with their, their um, project manager this morning, and they think it's imminent over the next week or two. Excellent. Okay, Roman, the... Uh, so then I'll keep going with the capital project. So um, the capital project obviously includes the landscape project in front of the clubhouse. I'm very happy with the progress that, that's uh, being made there. I, I think uh, it's... Um, you know, it, it shows we, on the committee level, we spent a lot of uh, time with the design of this and discussing the design and discussing what we wanted to accomplish. And, and it's really uh, great to see uh, it in front of us. I, I think that cart staging area next to the um, next to the starter shed is going to be a game changer. I really think we've we've, we've designed a, a very functional area there and uh, the gentleman who's doing the work is, is on schedule to have this completed in early april he's aiming for april 1st uh, the the final step of his uh, of his job is going to be the paving and then a lot of that's determined by when the uh, when the plants open for pavement but um we're right on schedule and his, his work has been uh, very 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 uh, high high quality if anybody hasn't been there to see it i know clem's done a great job sharing pictures with the committee uh, the pavers for the walkways are, are just, I, I think they're great. I think that it's really high quality work and it's, it's going to be a game changer for our operation, for our customer service, for our customer experience. So uh, I, I think that's a very well-conceived project that's being executed at a very high level. And then uh, as far as the uh, charger grid, uh, where that currently stands is the bid is currently uh, we're accepting bids at this point. Bids need to be in by Thursday at two o'clock where we'll have the bid opening for that. We had a mandatory site visit uh, this past Thursday where we had six vendors show up uh, all from off Cape. And uh, we were um, not happy to see here that none, none of the vendors 
have any experience with a car barn, but uh, we discussed at our procurement meeting that Clem attended yesterday. We have a very strong package that, that we spent a lot of time with an electrical engineer designing. So we feel like we've really got a, got a strong design in place that if we use a reputable, reputable vendor, um, we'll, we'll get the product we want from that. So that, that's, those bids are due in on Thursday. I'll share with the committee when, when they come in um, what we've received, but then you, we'll have to evaluate those bids, see if any of them meet our needs and meet our price requirements. If so, the, they'll, they'll be brought to the selectmen for, to award the bid. Uh, we're hoping that'll be by the end of the month. And then the, the actual job itself has a completion date of June 30th. It must be completed by June 30th. So progress is being made there as well. John, yes. Uh, Roman, is any one of the bidders Ed Eldridge? No, I spoke. I spoke directly with Ed. Ed chose. Uh, I guess I had many conversations with Ed. He chose not to bid. And what was the reason for that? Do you know, John. Well, John. I was just going to add, Roman, that uh, in our discussion with the procurement officer, John, uh, Mr. Elric uh, felt that there was a uh, just an awful lot of uh, hurdles, uh, I, you know, legal uh, commitments and so on, and he he just uh, chose not to uh, get involved in the process. Uh, you know, he. He's, he's very much, uh, I think Roman characterized it as an old school kind of a guy. And uh, unfortunately, this being a municipal project, we don't have the luxury of doing business uh, the old fashioned way. And uh, does that represent Roman? He's, he's so old school that, that you'll get a laugh out of this. I had to print the 80 page, 80 plus page bid package and um, put the paper in an envelope and mail it for $8.50 to him because he doesn't do email. So that that's pretty old school, uh, but uh, he is a great, he, 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 I mean, he's got a, he's done 135 car barns. So, you know, we, we were interested in him, but uh, all along he, he put up hurdles for us where he said, you know, I don't respond to bid packages. I get the job. He, he's been telling us that all along. So uh, I, he told me a third of the jobs he's done have been for municipalities. So I'm not sure how he's, you know, our town administrator was a little miffed by that too. And, you know, find out how he's done the procurement when he hasn't had to respond to an RFP. Um, but anyway, we, we have six vendors that, that showed interest and it, none of them, uh, he, he was not among them. Uh, yes, Steve. Does our design spec call for retractable power cables? It does not, Steve. I, I, ch I checked with our vendor, the, the, our preferred vendor. Uh, he does not recommend those. He, say, he said he's seen them experimented with in the past and, and without success. Uh, what I did was I, I, I got very specific with our, um, with our uh, um, design, uh, with our electrical engineer and our um, future car vendor and uh, about exact placement. You know, it's really... Well, what's really needs to be specific is how high these chargers are hanging, where the shelf is in relation to the cart, where the plug is. So, you know, that it's, it's very specific in that regard. And we have some flexibility in where the shelving is going to be. The, the shelving was actually included as an ad alternate in the bid. So uh, the, the bidders are going to bid on the actual electrical grid, and then they're going to choose if they would like to submit a bid for hanging the shelf because uh, the electrical engineer said, you know, a lot of these little electrical companies are not going to want to get involved in hanging shelves. If that is the case, or if it turns out the price to hang the shelves is too much, we'll utilize either town resources or we'll, we'll utilize a local vendor to hang the shelf. Um, um, so we'll, we'll see on that one. That, that's still uh, to be determined when, we see, when, when the bids come in. Okay, and last item, Roman, the uh, carts. Yes, so um, Clem, I'm going to be a little vague with the card situation, and I I've, I know you were part of this meeting yesterday, Clem. I've been in contact with with our um, task force from the golf committee, John Crook and John Wheeler, about the situation. We we're in negotiation with our current vendor 
and a proposed future vendor that I really don't want to uh, compromise the, our, our position in, in those negotiations by really mentioning anything other than to say, uh, we've got stuff in the works. We're going to, we're going to have uh, we're pursuing electric carts for this year. And uh, we've got things in the works right now that I, I don't really want to compromise in a public setting because they're in negotiations. Is that fair, Clem? Understood, Roman. And, uh, you know, I, we certainly appreciate the work that uh, John Wheeler and uh, John Crook have done uh, collaterally with you on that uh, project. Uh, I, I guess to sum it up, there are people, a lot of moving parts, and, uh, you know, we want to have in place, bottom line, uh, a better fleet uh, to be available this spring and, uh, you know, the eventuality of, uh, you know, a, a new electric fleet at some point in time. So I think we can leave it at that. Uh, anyone else? Can I, can I mention uh, the, the improve the um, new addition with Miller Golf that, that was discussed? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so a you know, uh, very exciting development with Miller Golf that, that, you know, with their signing of their new uh, license agreement with us, Bob Miller went out and, and bought a nice Mercedes van that he wants to um, improve his offerings, whether it, you know, be video lessons um, or you know, this opportunity to, to, um, add, to add more technology to his offerings. He's very excited about this. I think it's going to really um, have a positive impact to, for our customers of what his offerings can be. So he's going to have this really nice Mercedes van. We've worked with uh, Sean Fernandez to clear a, a, a path for him to drive to his private teaching area and have a um, not not a not a concrete pad, but a, a grass pad basically where he can park it. That'll be low impact, and uh, he'll be able to have increased increases to his offerings. I'm re I really commend Bob for investing in in, in what he's going to do at Cranberry Valley. So I think that's going to. Adds, add a lot to our operations. So kudos to Bob for adding that uh, service. I think that's, uh, that's certainly exciting, Roman. And, and to the group, I would say this, uh, consistent with the call it a personal feeling about this, uh, I was a little bit chagrined, uh, correct me, Roman, but we do not have electric available out there at the uh, teaching shed as it, as it exists right now, correct? That's correct. I mean, the, the current shed on the driving range is strictly a storage shed. That was never meant to be a, a, an office type environment that he keeps his, his range balls, his, his fitting equipment, teaching equipment in there. So that, that's a storage shed, but there is no electric to it. Um, if we ever wanted to bring electricity there, it, it, would, it would be a little problematic, but um, I think Bob's found a nice workaround. I mean, I, I think this is a nice alternative that he's found. He, 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 he uh, utilizes the shed and we'll continue to utilize the shed for storage, but uh, he's going to add the technology component with the van. I know that uh, I know that range access. Everybody has been extraordinary, correct, Roman? Uh, historic. I mean, it's, been, it's been historic. It's unbelievable. And the point is, uh, I'd like to take. Uh, I challenge the the group, the committee. I'd like to take a look at the amenities uh, associated with the range itself. Uh, you know, we've got. Uh, issues as far as uh, balls being lost at the end of the range and uh, the necessity for netting. So there's, you know, I, I think this is something that we might be able to uh, roam and amplify on. And, uh, you know, just to make sure that we're meeting the, the needs of uh, not just the annual pass holders, but, uh, you know, the general public. Uh, yeah, I agree, Clem. I, I think the nets need to be addressed ASAP, and they're, they're on our priority list. But um, you know, I, I, I don't have it in front of me for for investment in the repair, or I'm sorry, the, the replacement of the nets that are currently there. A solution, whether it be purchasing the net, a six foot net for the back of the range, or a different solution there. And I also think the, uh, the when we look at capital investments, um, we need to look at the range shed itself. There's a lot of technology there. Uh, you know, I, I, I have, I have uh, many senior, uh, senior members of our staff that uh, are expected to carry a large bushel basket of balls and go up a small step ladder to dump them into the back of the, 
um, Hopper, which is an accident waiting to happen. Uh, the, yeah. These companies, if, if you have, a, if we had a larger fo footprint for that shed and a, possibly a new shed, they offer elevators, uh, you know, for, for the golf balls and uh, soakers. And so, I would like as we look at you know capital projects uh, because the range, driving range itself is, is seeing such a surge in business that we look at um, investing in in that side of the operation definitely. Well. Uh, you know, I, obviously I agree with you. Uh, I, I would like to see that happen, uh, you know, sooner than later. Uh, any other comments, people, relative to any of the topics that Roman has just addressed? Martha, thank you. Martha? Um, this is <clears throat> one that's not on here, Roman, but I, the woman would like to know where we stand on reevaluating the handicaps on certain holes at the course. We've been discussing this for two years and nothing has happened. The, ha the handicap allocation holes? The, yes. the allocation holes? Okay. Uh, we, yeah, we've discussed this and it's never come to a uh, conclusion of what, you know, what we necessarily want to do with it as far as uh, the ladies leadership. Uh, I do know we've got all the, you know, the, the days of collecting scorecards, you know, 800 scorecards or so in the past are, it, is not necessary. All the information is in um, the Golf Genius program. I think there are some considerations if we want to um, um, print new scorecards with new handicap allocations. We, we're always welcome to do that. I, I, I um, I, I have not heard that the ladies' leadership wanted to pursue that. I'm having a hard time dealing with that in that we have met with Dick a number of times. The leadership from the Women's League have met. I met a couple of years ago. There are certain holes that are not evaluated correctly. And as all as we want is somebody to come out there and evaluate them so that our handicaps are correct. Well, Martha, well, one thing I can say is I, I have been part of those discussions. Oh, I have been part of those discussions. There's there's nobody that comes out to evaluate those. That's all in-house. That, that's data-driven. Um, when you're talking about handicap allocation. Do that, Roman. If you have all the data, then why isn't it completed? It can be. Uh, we have talked about it, but we have never seen anything. Okay, well, um, I'll have to pursue that. I have shared data in the past with the Ladies Association. I, I, not, not you particularly, Martha, but I, I believe Janet. And um, I mean, I, you know, I guess I, I would look to the golf committee and say, um, you know, if this is not something you want to do, we want to do casually. This is, you know, if we want to do this for the ladies association, we should do this for the men as well. And uh, and this would change our scorecard, but it, it doesn't require anybody coming. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. So every year, and we've brought it up three or four times. If, the, if that's not an issue for the men, that's fine. But it is a major issue for the women. Okay. okay. Uh, All right, we, we can definitely pursue that. Uh, what, Clem, what do you think? Does, does the committee yeah. have a role in this? Well, I, I would th think it yeah, shouldn't be our role. Let's. Uh, you're, you're the professionals at the club, that's the director of golf. I yeah. mean, I think it should have to go through the golf committee. No, but I mean, I, I think you don't want to do this casually because we want to have a plan of how often we do this. You know, if, if this is brought forward by, you know, what which group brings us forward and wants it. And then, I mean, I've been through this before many other golf courses where I've worked. What's the, what happens is next year when you if you have a, once you change the scorecard, you get a lot of complaints. That's not right because there's so many misconceptions on what handicap allocation is. It's not, it has nothing to do with which hole's harder and which hole's easier. It has to do with the, the, the separation of average scores per hole. So, you know, I, I think I wouldn't want to do it haphazardly. I, I would want to make sure that we have a, a clear direction from whether it's the ladies association or the committee to say, this year we're going to do the handicap allocation, and once we do them and print new scorecards, we we only do that every five years or so. It's not something you should do every year. 
Exactly. Uh, Steve, you had your hand up. Done. It hasn't been done in 10, 15 years. In, just for my own edification and clarification, what we're talking about, Martha, is which holes are, are handicapped one through 18 for the ladies? Yeah. Yeah. So a potential reshuffling of those. Not only does it have to do with handicapping, but it has to do with the grading, the slope grading. Yeah. Oh, that's different. So if we're talking about the slope, I mean, there's the two different issues, the handicap allocation for the holes. We can do that in-house. That's all just data driven. We've run a report and I've, I've done that with the ladies association in the past. There's a lot of misconceptions, as I said, about what, what holes are allocated for hand, num, the number one handicap, the number two handicap. 98% of the golf world thinks that's based on the hardest hole, and it's not. It's got nothing to do with which hole's harder or easier. Uh, there's very specific um, parameters by the USGA for doing that. We do have that capability in our own hands. A completely separate issue is having the golf course rated, the slope and the rating that we looked at, which we just had done a few, a few years ago by the MGA, uh, Mass, uh, MGA at that point, the Mass Golf Now. Uh, so it, once again, that's something we should only do every 10 years or so. That, that, that's not something you, you do uh, re regularly. Uh, if it was done for three years, now where is that report? Well, I'm sorry, can you say that again, Martha? I said if it was done two or three years ago, where is that report? Um, I, I'm sure I have it. It changed our scorecards. I mean, I guess I, what I would say is the report is the scorecard the, the, when, the, when the rating and the slope changed. The scorecards have not changed, Roman. Well, folks, let's, uh, Roman, why don't we do this? Uh, why don't you and your staff uh, address the issue and uh, the points that you want to make, and and perhaps we can, uh, you know, bring this uh, forward to the uh, April meeting for clarification. Does that work for you, Martha? Yes. Okay, Roman. Uh, yeah, sure. So, maybe, Martha, maybe you and I should have a phone call because I want to make sure that we're clear on, you know, what we're actually talking about. Slope and rating are totally different than handicap allocation for holes. And you know, in order to um, address these, I think that we should, you know, like I said, you don't want to do these haphazardly. We don't want to do these just on a whim. I think we should really have the support to say we're going to do this now, and then when everybody raises hell when they don't like the answers, where we're not going to adjust based on it. It's 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 done, and it's done that way for five to ten years, you know, until the golf course changes. We're, of course, uh, rate slope and rating really uh, don't need to change unless something uh, significant changes on the golf course. Okay, thank you, Roman. Uh, folks, at this time, uh, and, and uh, I'm reaching out to uh, uh, the general public. Uh, thank you for participating. I'm sorry for the hiccup on the uh, uh, protocol number, uh, you know, to get into the meeting. So Mr. Barnes, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Wilson, thank you again. Uh, any comments, gentlemen, that you'd like to share? Mr. Barnes, your hand. You're okay? Dave, how about you? And Ken. Well, Clint, yeah. thank you very much for getting back. You can help us uh, get the right numbers on that on the agenda. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating, obviously, for members of public to be, uh, now we have people that really do want to participate. So thank you for clearing that up as quickly as you did. Well, I... I've got to backtrack because I don't know. I don't know what, exactly what happened. Uh, so, uh, you know, the buck stops here. I apologize. Uh, I do. I'm glad, to, I'm, glad know, to point. I'm sorry. No, I'm just glad we were able to get you into the yeah. meeting. You know, to Martha's point, Roman, I think, and having been on the golf committee and served on the handicap committee in prior places myself, if they, if the ladies have all the scores in hole by hole, as do the men, and Golf Genius will run these numbers for you. I, I think we're talking about that and not slope and rating. And so that being the case, I, I would hope that you could come back to the next meeting and say, based on the actual data put in there, here's what it would reflect. I think because that's how you think move forward to Martha's point as opposed to talking about it. That's how things would move forward. So I hope it, it, it'd be 
that makes sense to you. But other than that, I'm really pleased about what I see at the golf course. I'm excited about the numbers that are coming in. And, you know, the, the time and effort that you guys have put in on this, and Martha included the guy, sorry about that term, but uh, appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Ken, thank you. Uh, if there is no other business to, oh, uh, sorry, Dave, or David? Yeah, both. yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'm glad on this strategic mission, uh, you guys also included the AT improvement project. This is something I've brought up in the past uh, and I'm advocating for some of the women that I know on that. And, and I think it's also aligned with uh, Martha's topic on the handicapping. So and I'm, I'm glad to see that because I know that Mark Mungan uh, years ago, I, I think it's been like five or six years since he made his report, you know, advocated for changes in some of the T's. And I don't want to see that get lost. Uh, yeah. I would like to see some of those uh, changes made that he recommended and I'm not talking about the carts or the cart paths. I'm talking about the uh, shortening of the uh, some of the red tees. So I think that effort should go hand in hand with a thoughtful response on which holes you know have what handicaps, uh, particularly from the red tees that I know is a hot topic item in and of itself. So I'm glad to see that stays in there, and, and please keep that in the uh, in your. Um, your priorities as you're looking where to spend money. Thank you. Uh, Jack Conley. This is in relation to Martha's question. You have green, we have green tees on, on many holes. Do we have a rating for the green tees? Yes, there is a rating for the green tees. And uh, our, our, our ladies association uh, plays from those tees at certain points of the year. Is it, is it on the card though? Um, I don't believe it's on the current card. It, it's it's in the handicap system. So if you play if you play from those tees, you can post your handicaps for for those tees. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh, John Crook. Uh, one of the things we talked about the last meeting, Clem, was uh, revisiting the gate for security purposes at Cranberry Valley. And also uh, making sure that we have some type of security system and lights in the parking lot to protect the cot bond investment as well as the solar initiative. I want to make sure that we bring this up so that we just don't lose sight of, uh, you know, it might take a few dollars, but I think it's worthwhile, number one, to start with putting the gate back in or locking the gate every night and then also putting some type of lights and security in the parking lot. I can address that Clem. So we are, we are exploring uh, is, uh, options as far as the gate goes, John. Um, it turns out we have no electricity there. So we're, we're looking into um, possibly either running some electricity there or, or using a solar power gate. Uh, they, they, they offer both options. So Sean Fernandez is currently looking at both of those and we, we, we support that project 100%. Uh, we'll, we'll add that to our operational um, directives for our staff uh, one once we can uh, get that done and then as far as lighting in the parking lot goes we're still exploring options there too as, as part of the overall car barn project we do have the floodlights off the um car barn currently that cover a lot of the parking lot but i think a few strategic ones on the on the back end of the parking lot would help and uh and then the as part of the project going on uh with the landscaping in front of the clubhouse there's lighting involved there as well so th that's all being pursued and the security side is, as well a member of sean's staff uh is uh is going to install security cameras once the electrical infrastructure is in place in the car barn so that we would have um security cameras on the car barn john thanks for uh, bringing that up because uh you know obviously uh, it is important, uh, Roman. I appreciate the fact that uh, you're pursuing that, uh, and uh, you know maybe at our next meeting in April, uh, if there are any updates you can share with us, uh, you know as far as options or plans, A, B, and C, whatever, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, if there's no further business to bring uh, before the committee, uh, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. No motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Okay. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 People, thanks for your uh, time, attention, and uh, 
due diligence. And uh, as, as noted on our uh, agenda, at least, Ken, I think it says this, the next meeting is scheduled for April 20th. Correct, everyone? <laughs> yep. Yes, John. Yes, John. Is this our last Zoom meeting? I wish to God it was. Has everybody got their shot? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll check with the town administrator. Uh, I, I mean.